something that has to go on inside. And if it doesn't, um, you know, you're wasting your time, basically. And then there is the collective side. And I said last week, that was kind of the, the plague or the blight of our generation is we got off so much about all the inside personal stuff for a while that we forgot that there's also a collective side. I can't learn everything on my own. I need you. I can't do everything on my own. I need your gift. I want you to do an inventory in your head. And I want you to, to click off in your head how many times you hear something that is just wrong for a nation or a person who's supposed to be a person of God, uh, a culture that's supposed to be a culture of God, and they're missing the mark. And, and there, there's the thing. You can go down through it, one, two, three, and see what you find. Now, the story of Micah. Now, there was a man from the mountains of Ephraim whose name was Micah. And he said to his mother, the 1,100 shekels of silver that were taken from you and on which you put a curse, even saying it in my ears, here is the silver with me. I took it. And his mother said, may you be blessed by the Lord, my son. So when he had returned the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I have wholly dedicated the silver in my hand to the Lord for my son. What for? To make a carved image and a molded image, now there I will return it to you. Then he returned the silver to his mother. Then she took the 20, uh, 200 shekels of silver and gave it to the silversmith, and he made it into a carved image and a molded image, and they were in the house of Micah. The man Micah had a shrine and made an ephod and housed idols, and he cons consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Now there was a young man from Bethlehem in Judah, of the family of Judah, and he was a Levite. And he was sojourning there. The man departed from the city of Bethlehem in Judah to sojourn wherever he could find a place. Then he came to the mountains of Ephraim to the house of Micah as he journeyed. And Micah said to him, Where did you come from? So he said, I am a Levite from Bethlehem in Judah, and I am on my way to find a place to sojourn. Micah said to him, Dwell with me, and be a father and a priest to me, and I will give you ten shekels of silver per year, a suit of clothes and your sustenance. So the Levite went in. Then the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man became like one of his sons. Uh, so Micah consecrated the Levite, and the young man became his priest and lived in the house of Micah. Then Micah said, Now I know that the Lord will be good to me since I have a Levite priest. How many things did you check on? It's probably if you were getting all of them, maybe you were in your second hand as you were checking things off. What's going on? The story starts out with moral bankruptcy. This fellow is stealing from his own mother. That's, uh, you know, uh, not a very good place to be. Uh, morally. And then it goes on from there. Quickly moves into superstition. Just when you think they might get it right, I'll dedicate this to the Lord. Oh, wonderful. I'll make a graven image. Superstition. I mean, what did even with the money? She cursed the money. And then she's uh, giving uh, uh, silver for idols. And, and the whole thing about this being so messed up, there's a reason. It almost seems like that line uh, that, that particular sentence put, is put in there out of the blue. And, it, and then it says, uh, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And if we were to look through Judges, we'd find that line over and over again. There was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. There is a king of kings. And there is a lineage that develops in Israel, promised from one king that would go on for eternity. But at this point, there was no king. And everyone did what was right in his own eyes. However, they wanted to do it. We find, but why is even that so wrong, even if we look at it logically? If we went back to Deuteronomy, we find the first place you find that line. And God has set it, and we know in Deuteronomy, this is where God's setting up the whole paradigm for Israel. This is how the nation is meant to run. And in all of this in Deuteronomy, he says, You shall not at all do as we are doing here today. Every man, whatever is right in his own eyes. In Deuteronomy, it said, okay, never again will this nation work this way. That You just do what's right in your own eyes. God said not to do it. And you know what? It's something we don't, we don't lose, even in the New Testament. The idea of everything being a private interpretation. That, you know, what's God 
for you? Uh, what is it uh, for you? How how are you going to practice? What what floats your boat? What your boat? What's the right thing for you? This is where Michael was. Is he came up with his own rules, his own place, and he was setting this up. And as a matter of fact, it says he made a shrine. He made his own temple in a time uh, that they were waiting for the temple, but there was a tabernacle at the time. God being in one place, but he made his own shrine, his own place of worship, and then he makes an ephod. Well, so what's the big deal? With it? Well, basically, the ephod was a girdle or breastplate. It was it was something the high priest was meant to wear. Nobody else wore an ephod. That was like all of us, if in our time we might say, if we all decided we we're all going to go to wherever you buy some of these supplies, and we all came here next week with a collar and a little, you know, and we were all looked like ministers, you know, only much, much worse because there was only one tribe, the Levites, who were meant to be priests at all, and only one of them got to be the high priest. This guy made himself, or his son, his own high priest. He, he did. So what did he do? He took spiritual authority he had no right to take. He did something that he had no right to do. And, and so what's the outcome of this as is, is this goes on? Uh, it, it, even worse, he goes on with this, the Levite shows up just traveling around. They were meant to be priests of the people. They were not a private enterprise. But this guy decides that he's going to uh, hire a priest just for himself. And there he is. And the whole idea is, now that I have a priest here, God will be good. I'll have good luck as I have a priest. So basically, it, we're back to superstition. It was like, I have this walking rabbit's foot here. I'll have good luck now. I've got this Levi. He's even better than my graven image. You know, there's, there's uh, only one thing worse than false religion. And that's a half false religion. And that's where he was. That's where Israel was. They, they had it all mishmashed together. Some of the things God taught them mixed with all kinds of other things until it was just this kind of hopeless mess of things that were going on. And so what's the result? Well, it says in Judges, if you look through it, it was a really dark time. This nation that was supposed to be the example, the light to the rest of the world, was one of the darkest places to live. There was all kinds of nasty stuff going on. There was no unity. There was no hope in the place. Everybody lived in fear. Everybody lived in suspicion of everyone else, even your own son, even your own mother. And, and uh, this was this small, small religion. It was only as big as me. And everybody did what was right in their own eyes. And it was a small, small religion that was supposed to follow a limitless God. Hmm. Makes me think of the church today, how small we make it sometimes. In the New Testament, the principle doesn't change with this um, not private interpretation. Second Peter 1.19 We also have a prophetic word, of course, speaking of the entire Bible in this case, made more sure, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart. you got the individual thing going on, you got the inner thing going on, but it's something bigger than you are, something beyond you. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. And we can look at the wording and basically in that it means nothing in Scripture. No principle is private interpretation. It is not for you and I to simply go, well, that's what it means to me. It doesn't work that way. Why not? In 21, verse 21, he sets it up because if it was, it would be a man-made religion. But it's not. But prophecy came from not the will of man, but holy men who were moved by the Holy Spirit. It's God's when it comes from outside and beyond us. It's a collective of things. It's a collective. There is a place for what happens to you as an individual. And then there is the place where, or the, the situation that involves us as a collective thing in this whole plan. So, I mean, this guy, we look at it, Judges, uh, it's depressing, really. Uh, one of the books to read through is you read through Judges. It just hits you with this. It was just anarchy. It was just all things going uh, a miss and a ride, people just disunity. It was just a uh, crazy, confusing time. So, does that exist today? Well, I would propose to you that we, in fact, live in the time of judges because we have gone back to people doing what is right in their own eyes. Doing simply what is right in their own eyes. Except we don't call it the book of judges, we call it postmodernism. And that's where we are with this. Does the genuine article get mixed up with falsehoods in our day? Wow. Just go to a movie. Just go see something like the Da Vinci Code. 
Can you imagine if somebody just had that movie uh, a, a million years from now or whatever, a thousand years, never heard of Christianity, and the only thing they knew was what they saw in, in a movie like that? Or, or maybe some of those, the, uh, the uh, prophetic ones like the uh, End of Days or uh, um, uh, some of those other ones like uh, Legion and these things where and people are, uh, you know, angels doing all kinds of interesting things. In these. If that was the only thing people ever saw about what the Christian message was, what a hopeless mess. See, the problem in our culture as we look at it today isn't even so much that we have to, to, to go out and and the challenge is for people to accept the gospel or to accept Christ. With what's in our culture today, they don't even know what it is. There's such a mishmash of teaching with non-teaching, with fantasy mixed up with the real thing, that, that it's not distinguishable out there. So somebody, somewhere, needs to show the real thing. But you know what? The real thing, maybe it starts with the individual but it, it, it has no impact with one person. It takes the collective. It takes the family. It takes uh, the, the whole situation. Do we have any Michael, Micahs in our day? You know, the, the story, was that just some guy, you know, a lone wolf up there making his, his uh, ephod in the shrine and hiring people? You know, when I read that story on Micah, it actually takes me back to a personal memory. I can't even remember exactly where I was driving, but it was driving with a friend that was a really nice looking uh, church facility. I said, that's a pretty cool looking place. What's the story with that? I didn't see any kind of denominational thing or anything. I don't know, whose church is that? And he went on to explain that there was a fellow in town who, uh, he did have a good intentions in, in, in a faith uh, of one kind or another, and he decided that they needed a church there, so he built his own private church. It was his building, his property, his facility. Then he went out and he hired his Levite. He hired, I don't know where, a minister of his choosing, but it was his show. It was his place. And he was, that was the thing. It was his thing. Private interpretation. Men doing what is right in their own eyes. What's any different from that than uh, Micah? If we look at our culture today, there are small churches that are controlled by maybe one family or two families. And they kind of run the show there. Or you don't have to be small. There are large churches that basically they're a family dynasty. The father came up with something, got lots of people going, and then he turns it over to a son and a daughter, whatever, and it just keeps going. Private interpretation. I used to say, and let me throw out something that is going to really hit you guys sideways, or maybe many of you. I used to be in this mindset myself that non-denominational was a positive word. It meant that, well, this place isn't all hung up on doctrine. Um, they're just about Jesus. So let's get rid of the church politics and we'll go there because it's non-denomination. Well, I have to tell you today that even though I felt that way, it is a red flag for me now when I see non-denomination. Not that I immediately, there are, I, we're partnered with churches that are considered non-denominational. But uh, in those cases, it's, it's simply a case of they're coming from strong roots where they're coming from. It's just that they don't really publicize. But a church that is truly non-denominational and they're off on their own, that means they can come up with whatever strikes their fancy. And if they have a wrong private interpretation, there's no one to correct them. They're not accountable really to anyone else, just their own little thing. So non-denominational itself is not a positive thing. It still falls back to the right in your own eyes. And a point out too is that a few people have said to me too, and we, we kind of joke on that line, is there is no such thing as non-denomination, right? Everything, it may be a denomination of one, but it's a denomination. You have, whoever the person is, has some uh, cocktail of beliefs that they put together that they think is right, and, and so they have a doctrine that they follow their own thing. It may be a denomination of 30 people, but it's still, a, a, in essence, a denomination. So, so there's no such thing, really. But the bottom line is this. We are living in a culture where more and more, even within the church, there are people just going off and doing what is right in their own eyes. And by the way, we're not non-denomination. The church is affiliated with the Christian Missionary Alliance. I am. I am accountable. If I get up here and say something wrong, any of you could go to the district office and say, you know what that guy's teaching? And I would be held accountable. And that's the way it should be. We need to be accountable. Nothing is private interpretation. 
But we live in a culture now that is all about the individual. And so we have all kinds of individual faith stuff going on. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you shouldn't have a personal experience. I'm not saying you shouldn't have a conviction in yourself what's true and what's not. But the paradigm with God is not that you get all the answers. The paradigm is that in the collective, we counsel each other, we learn from each other, we keep each other in counsel. Uh, in the New Testament, uh, there's only one name for what this collective is, this, this whole thing. Ephesians 5, 25 says, Husbands, love your wives. Well, there's a good one. If nothing else, ladies, remember that line and you can go home and, and say, Husbands, remember what, what was said in the sermon this morning. But let's go on. The focus is really not family here. It's the next line. Just as Christ also loved the church. Christ also loved the church. And gave himself for it. And that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. And in the end chapter, in the whole thing, Revelation 21, 2, then I, John, saw, here it comes a big climax of things, the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Christ died for you and me. There's no question. And we put that message out. But the truth is, what he really died for was the church. What he's coming back for is the church. Not so much just you and me. Uh, we are called to be part of the church. But he's coming back. That's his paradigm. And that moves us away. This is the only identity given to this collective group God is coming back for is called the church. It's not called anything else in Scripture. It's his bride. That's what it is. And it removes us from a place we can go for private interpretation or doing what's right in our own eyes. Back to the Old Testament, Proverbs 12, 15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. But he who heeds counsel is wise. Okay, then what is balance? Do we have a model of what the balance looks like? Scripture has some of the clearest paradigms explained as far as what balance is. And, and to bring you to one, and actually it, it's something that, uh, that, that's why the title of, of the sermon today, What a Body. Now, some of you might have thought I was talking about you. I don't know. But I'm talking about the church. And if uh, it's one of those things where you don't have a sheet to write it down or mark your Bible, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, an absolutely amazing chapter in explaining this. But the manifestation of the Spirit, and we'll always come back to that, to the Spirit, is given to each one, each one, but for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, and of course everyone has faith that's talking about extraordinary faith, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. And of course there's a, a whole long series just in what those gifts are. But the point is, through this, everyone is an individual, everyone is unique, but it's the same spirit. And it's for not your edification, but you're given what you're given for the benefit of all. Collective, personal, and balance. But one and the same spirit working all these gifts, distributing to each one individually as he wills. For as the body is one, it has many members. But all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. There will be no power. We will not influence this culture. We will not do what God has for us to do. If we, even no matter who you are in yourself, if you are not part of the body, you will not experience all God has for you if you are not part of the body. You will not learn what God has for you to learn unless you are part of the body. And, and that works its way down. It, it, it's the church as a whole. It's whatever. I, I'm not going to get into denominations and who's good and who's not. not. That's not the issue. But that group of people, and then down to the local body where you are physically, this is where the rubber meets the road. It'd be great to say you're a Baptist or a Methodist or whatever. That's fine. But what Baptist church are you a driving force? What Methodist church are you making better by being there? 
At some point, you, the rubber has to meet the road. There's the individual and there's the collective, and there has to be both. And as I was running over this, it's just so vitally important that this whole idea of where the collective plays into your Christianity and this individualistic culture, I, I was trying to think of how this might pull together that we would remember it. And so I, I, that's why we come to this. I want to give you a physical picture of what the paradigm is of God. And, and you know, the disadvantage of being around a lot is you get asked to do things. So Rick was here the other night, so I asked Rick to be this starting point. I said, don't worry about it, I'll talk you through it for the most part, Rick. So I want you to hear this man, and we're going to call Rick the Acts 2 man. Does anyone remember what happened in Acts chapter 2? No one. Okay, everybody break up your Bibles. Acts 2, wonderful thing. The Holy Spirit comes down. The, the disciples and the apostles are affected. Peter gives the first great sermon. And in that sermon, he, he points out in irrefutable ways to the Jewish audience, the Jewish people in the city, that Christ is the Messiah. And then he ends up with the line, and you killed him. What a great, maybe we should try to evangelize him. He's God to really convince people who God is, and then end with that, and you killed him. Because that's the truth. Until that hits you, and so the people were what? Cut to the heart. That's where salvation starts. So here is Rick. He's my Acts 2 man. And Rick was living a life and he was just doing his thing. He was fine. This didn't exist. He didn't even see it. He wasn't on his radar. And then someone from the outside approaching Rick, and they presented this, and now this was on his radar. And he was cut to the heart by this. And so he says, what can I do? I'll even do your lines for you, right? You just have to look like really sad, that's all. And he asks, what can I do? And then, uh, there's a few things I should have explained as far as what each thing represents here. This tarp underneath is not just the tomb thing. This is the Holy Spirit. Think, think of this tarp as everything to do with the Holy Spirit. There it is, the, the fabric of, of the Holy Spirit of God, the person of the Holy Spirit. Well, the cross, I think you can figure that one out. And the cross isn't just representing Christ. The cross is everything the Son means. Everything He does, everything He did do. Everything to do with the personhood of Jesus is represented by the cross. Now, there's a third person, person to the Trinity. Here it is, pop quiz. I told you the Holy Spirit and the Son who's left. The Father. Now, the Father will be the words then that I, I speak. They will represent the Father. So when Rick has said, what shall I do? The answer comes, turn from your sin, return to God, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, then you shall receive something. All right. The gift of the Holy Spirit. So, in the process, Rick does all of these things. And because through the right of what Jesus did, the opportunity opened, he is allowed to grab the Holy Spirit. Now the other thing I didn't share is the purpose of all of this is God's will when we put it all together. And God's will is that we lift up the cross. And the means of lifting up the cross, and by you can take that in a figurative sense, it means to bring to the world, to live, to honor, to, to glorify, to be true to. But our job is to lift up the cross in this world. So now, in this physical sense, Rick has gone through this process. He's been cut to the heart. He's been told what to do. He's done these things. And now he is allowed to take hold of the Holy Spirit. So, Rick, take hold of the Holy Spirit. Now, Rick also knows that the will of God is to lift up the cross. So here he is. He's doing everything he should be doing. And he tries to lift up the cross. And, you know, yeah, it's not going very well, buddy. He is not able to lift up the cross. He's trying, but it's out of balance. It's not right. He's not getting it done. So Rick talks to other folks. And the, and the Spirit of God as he moves other folks, and he talks to other people who, uh, who go through the same process. They're cut to the heart. What must I do? And they repent, they're baptized, and all of this. And they are allowed to take up the cross, take a hold of the Holy Spirit. So Jim is now saved. Jim, you're saved now. Okay. So Jim knows all of this. And so, as Jim, he gives all to the poor, you be the poor. And Jim and Rick take hold of the Holy Spirit. 
and they lift up the cross and the will of God. Well, you know what? They're not doing too bad, but this is a pretty shaky scenario here. Here's two guys. Not only that, they're carrying the whole weight themselves. But even still, this is still not right. You tired, guys? Okay. But can you keep holding on just for a second? I'll, I'll give you back a There's still something profound going on here, you see, because Rick is holding the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is connected to the cross. And guess what? Here's Jim over here with the Holy Spirit. And he's connected to the cross. But now, Rick is connected to Jim. They have become one. You were looking at the beginning of the church. It's not totally together, but it's getting there. So God does the same thing. See, did you notice when these guys came up, the individual came into place. I called Rick by name. Jim didn't know, but I called him by name. And then he left his glasses, maybe he didn't pour it, he came up. So, and here they are being the church. But it's still not totally stable because he has a corner of the Holy Spirit. He has a corner, he has his gift, he has his gift. And they're sharing their gift. And it's almost balanced, almost there, but not totally. So God calls more people by name. He says, Jacqueline. Come up here. She goes through the whole process, cut to the heart of this, and she takes her corner of the Holy Spirit. And, and, and then i got to get somebody over here. Dwayne, God's calling you by name, brother. And Dwayne goes through all of this, and he takes his corner of the Holy Spirit. And you see, Dwayne's been gifted at an area of the Holy Spirit that no one else has. So he pulls the balance there. And, and Rick has something that Dwayne doesn't have, so he can pull the balance. Even though it's helping Dwayne, it's Rick's gift. And Jim and, and Jacqueline. So let's see how we do now with four corners of the Holy Spirit. Wow. Things are starting to look pretty bad. Still not all that light. Four people in this entire room carrying the burden of God's will, lifting up the cross. God, that's still not his spirit. So God calls other people by name. And he says, Kevin, calling you by name. And, and Rick calling, uh, Rich calling you by name. And Becky, I'm calling you by name. And we're going to balance it out of Pam. I'm calling you by name. Kathy calling you by name. Carol calling you by name. And here come the rest of the church. And I want you to imagine that I called you by name. Everyone. Here they are. Everyone. Cut to the heart. What must I do? They repented. Turned to God. Baptized. And then received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Where Carol's holding, nobody else is holding. That's her place. Where Kathy is, that's her place. But yet, they're all one. They are all connected. They are collectively together. And can you lift up the cross? Is it that heavy? No. Okay. That's so we can leave you there for like a whole time, long time. I'll let you guys put it down and even go and sit down if you would. You're now dispersed into the world. Go and make disciples, anyone. Do you see where we're going with the balance of things? It took the individuals, but they had to be collectively tied in. And if Jim was missing, Rick felt it. And if Becky wasn't there, then Carol felt it on the other side. If you put off, and, and I missed one thing, and it's fine. I'm not going to make you guys come back up. But if you understand the collective side, that's great. Everybody must have been holding on, and everyone had to be lifted. Now, what I missed, and I should have said, was I should have had like every third person let go, but stay there. And from where you're looking, you would say, oh, well, they're still part of the crowd. They're still there. But they weren't holding on. They really weren't. They were no longer part of them. They, they looked like they were. They were there. I'm sure you see where I'm going with that. Churches are filled with people who are in with the group, but they're not holding on. They're not part of the real lifting force. The Holy Spirit collectively we must be connected. And if we're not, if you're not, or I'm not, we lose, and everyone else loses.